This is the Build OGM call for Tuesday, November 30th, 2021. Hey, Stacey. Um, Hello. <laughs> are you driving or out and about? Not yet. Not yet. I'm walking the dog right now. I'll be in the car in a few minutes. Thanks. Excellent. Now you're in the category of OGMers who are walking the dog. <laughs> is it, which is it a thing. It's a category. I um, <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> um, and so... Uh, so I, Stacey, I just told Pete that I haven't written yet a note uh, sort of canvassing for a virtual assistant of some sort, so I do that. Um, and also, and Mr. Kronza. Uh, and Pete has just started a HackMD for our note taking. And there's Mark. No Mark. Yes, Mark. There, excellent, excellent. Mark has, re Mark has wrestled control of his machine back from the software gremlins. It's voodoo. <laughs> That's like. Was that your incantation? Yes. Nice. Nice. Morning. Morning. How goes it for you? Um, turned 59 yesterday. Happy <laughs> birthday. That's right. Um, happy birthday. And, and close to mine, I'm, my birthday's coming up at the end of the week. So huh? I'm turning 62. Holy shit. Yeah. I don't know how that happened. Um, that's my basic baseline reaction holy shit <laughs> just like seriously how'd that happen yeah yeah uh, uh, but yeah good uh, uh had some back surgery uh last week um kind of recovering from that and uh, sure. uh, uh here to listen um and just barely woke up so um i will i will do some more listening and then catch up um as we go on. Thanks for joining us. Um, and then, and then uh, Pete, you and I, I think need to catch up on Krav and, and items about how things fit. And we've got a call later today to, to do uh, some of that stuff. So that should be fine. Uh, and then I've been uh, paying attention to pick Jerry's brain uh, for the last, basically over the long weekend because I really got to figure out a normal steady stream of income, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I've got lots of moving parts uh, up and I haven't rewritten like the homepage of Pictures Brain, but that's where my attention has been. It's been on like, how do I, um, and have you heard of a language market fit? No. Uh, so I will find the article, uh, but product market fit is a common phrase sort of in startup community. Uh, but there's a, there was a nice article from first round, I think. Uh, there it is. Um, there was a nice article from first round where uh, it talks about finding language market fit, which is like, what language does your market speak and how do you connect with them? Uh, and parts of the article were sort of way more uh, elaborate than things that I think I'm going to do about you know market testing uh, in large mass market ways. But parts of the article were really good about uh, about finding that language, and so I'm trying to figure out how not to speak about me, but how to speak about the needs I can fulfill as Picture's brain. So that's kind of where my head is for the top uh, the top of the page. Um, There we go. Um, and so maybe the thing to do is to collectively draft a, a virtual assistant note. I think that would probably, that would certainly help me um, move forward on stuff. HackMD, okay. HackMD would work. And I'm just getting caught up. And then um, through the budget from the Rutt Foundation grant, I, my Mac should be on its way. I got a note that it's on its way into customs from <clears throat> in Shenzhen or somewhere. Um, and then the payment hasn't actually processed properly. So somehow the Mac is in, in motion toward me, but the money hasn't been deducted from my account. And I spent a bunch of time yesterday with my bank going, what's the deal here? And uh, Apple doesn't seem to know. And I'm 
If you want to just send me a machine, I'm okay. But uh, yeah. Anyway, so can't wait for that because my fan just kicked on and things are already slowing down. It's, uh, it's glorious. The thing I'm not looking forward to is how many things probably aren't going to be native. I'm going to have to work around because I use a bunch of uh, uh, menu uh, or whatever they're called, the new plugins. Uh, you know, uh, click uh, basically a virtual clipboard and a couple other good things. Text expander. I bet your text expander has not been rewritten for M1. And I'm pretty reliant on that. Um, okay, so shall I screen share or show you? Uh, either way. Um, why don't I, in that way, there we go. Uh, volunteers needed, dangerous mission, survival not guaranteed. Um, so, um, this is actually for weaving the world, right? It's this is for, this is for weaving the world. Yeah. This has nothing to do with uh, Victor's brain. This is entirely, uh, weaving the world. And it's a friendly note to people I know to find out who's got and who could recommend a, a virtual assistant service or person, right? Yep. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I hate capitalization. <laughs> so how did people, I guess there weren't that many people reading them, but there were no spaces or periods like early on. Everything was just run on and there were no yep. upper and lower case. Um, there was none of that. It was just like word, 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 word. And you had to parse it in your head and, and fit pauses in. And then they started to try to do like spaces and pauses for like the breathing breaks. I, I kind of think it was, it was more like stenography. And like we have a, you know, written culture for 2000 years or whatever. Um, but 2000, 3000 years ago, I think probably it was still mostly voice. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the written, written stuff was script notes for, you know, remembering what you remembered. Mm -hmm. This reminds me in a, in a bizarre way <laughs> of, of another pattern I think I've recently observed. Um, uh, Wendy Elford and I have been talking about DAOs, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an interesting thing where DAOs are actually two parts. There's the people who set up the rules of the game, and then there's and then you you code the rules of the game in smart contract language, and then you play the game, right? So a lot of the attention around DAOs is watching and thinking about the the players playing the game um, after the pachinko machine is already set up, right? It's like okay, so you know I'm putting a ball here, I'm putting a ball here, and it, it goes down this way. That's people look at the operation of it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about it for more than about two seconds, it's actually more important how you set up the game, mm -hmm. not so much the way the game gets played, even though the, mm -hmm. the way the game gets played is interesting. You know, how do you build a coalition? How do you delegate your votes? How do you, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's still interesting, but it's all of that is on the foundation of in the ground of how the DAO is set up, right? So thinking about that and thinking why we pay attention to the operation of the DAO rather than the creation, the construction of the DAO, I think my, I, I have a new hypothesis. Um, oh, good. Uh, my hypothesis is that we are so used to the way organizations work, um, uh, autonomous organizations, which we call corporations now, especially big ones. And we're used to them being opaque. So, um, you know, so, we have these massive uh, autonomous organizations in our lives called Google and Facebook and Apple and you know GM and whatever. Um, and all the news that we talk about is you know what's which ports are or are not on the MacBook or you know uh, um, you know how many how many small retailers has Amazon squashed or you know um, uh, the way. 
uh, Walmart pays its staff or doesn't pay its staff, right? <clears throat> so we talk about the operation of the autonomous organization. We don't talk about the way the organization is built because for a hundred years or so, corporations are behind a, 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 a veil where they get to do and construct themselves however they want within you know some bounds, loose mm -hmm. bounds. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we just think of organization, hey, there's an organization, what's it doing? What's it thinking? How is the pachinko balls falling through the pins, right? In a, and, and in a DAO, you really want to think of it the opposite way. How have we set up the DAO? How will we set up a DAO? How will we set up a DAO better than other DAOs, right? Right, right. Um, we have, you know, here's a DAO. Uh, we've just given you the, the clay to create an organization that isn't a copy of Apple and isn't a copy of Facebook. Do that, right? And everybody's like, yeah, I don't know how to do that. It's too hard. But I'm really interested in the way the pachinko balls fall. So that's my, my hypothesis about DAOs. And I think, so I have a prediction um, that as we keep setting up DAOs, um, we're, we're actually going to continue to replicate for probably years, maybe a decade. We're going to continue to replicate um, centralized organizations. We're, we're going to go, okay, we need a new organization and it's going to be decentralized this time. And it's going to end up having a hierarchy and having the centralization that Apple does or Facebook does or whatever, right? Just because we don't have the, um, the linguistics to be able to describe something different and imagine something different and, and to create something different. So um, love that, love that line. And um, let me just stop sharing for a second so we can see each other. Um, <clears throat> partly it seems like corporations have like default settings and we assume that those default settings are all the same and that there's these people called market analysts or Wall Street who give a damn about that, but they only give a damn about that within really, really narrow constraints. and then. Every now and then, a corporation innovates a whole bunch on that and makes Wall Street angry, which is only when we hear about it. So it's like, you know, Zuckerberg still has controlling interest because he has his own, his own category of shares of Facebook that, that out, can outvote everybody kind of thing, right? And he just made that a part of the, the, the death pact of, of, you know, investing in Facebook. And that was unusual. And Google, when it launched, was unusual in some of their documents and what they, you know, how they organized themselves. So it was like, oh, oh there's this there's exceptions to the default settings, right? But we've gotten so used to the default settings and the default settings create like a rapacious corporation, which is like the critique in the air that's been in the air for since the sixties, at least, if not well before. And yet now it's seeming may, maybe getting a little bit of lift, um, but we don't change those default settings, even though we all know that like these default settings kind of suck, right? Yeah. And then, and now somebody's saying, hey, there's a new way to, to create uh, organizations, to coordinate activity, to invest together and, route the funds. And I'm a little surprised that we don't have um, the equivalent of a uh, uh, sourdough starter library or DNA collections or um, like, here's the best of DAO structure that I've seen. And just like, let's go mix and match and put it on GitHub and, and like, oh, somebody just had a really clever idea and we were swapping out this piece of DNA of how DAOs work. And this is this is proving to work better in lots and lots of communities. And but but only if you've done this work beforehand together to get to that point of trust or whatever, right? And, and so description of the dance and all of that. And, and maybe this is happening in a tiny in a couple it, tiny it corners. Is. It's it's happening really well, actually. Oh, um, okay. So I'm missing that. Uh, so so then <laughs> I have another hypothesis. Oh good. Um uh uh Wendy's uh Winnie's happens to have a focus on DAOs for a couple of weeks, um, and um, and kind of immediately she went to the, you know, the the human parts of of uh, how we might coordinate and, and work together, right? The community aspects of it and the psychological aspects of it, and taking care of each other and things like that. And I said, yeah, I'll tell you what, Wendy, <laughs> uh, could you pull up um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy for me? And, and let's talk about where we are, right? Um, so, so my hypothesis there, I, she, she like made a, a, she made a similar face actually when I said. My, my radar goes up because whenever anybody invokes Maslow's hierarchy, I'm, I'm usually like, oh great, this is not I going said, to go well. I said, yeah, 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 I get it. Maslow's hierarchy is not the, the is not perfect, but it's still kind of a useful tool. Um, here's where we. A lot of all. 
yeah, overused. Um, uh, so where are we in the? In I, the I had a, a, a great friend, uh, Tiffany von Emmel, who uh, who taught me a lot about Myers Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. And snap, which is, snapfish, right? Which is uh, uh, dreamfish, dreamfish. dreamfish. Which is even more exciting than uh, Myers Briggs is even more exciting than Maslow's hierarchy. Than anyway, Maslow's hierarchy. Good point. <clears throat> um, uh, tools uh, tools are are really stupid ex unless they're in the hands of an expert and you know using the tool and you go, okay, well, I wouldn't have expected that from that tool. And otherwise, and, otherwise you get this. <laughs> So, um, so I said, I'll tell you what, my hypothesis again is that um, we're at the physiological level and at the safety security level, the bottom two levels, right? Um, we've kind of been able to get our heads around um, the, the bits and bobs that, that create um, uh, non fungibility and, you know, uh, and um, uh, pseudon pseudonymity. Um, uh, wallet addresses and things like that. That's kind of the physiological layer. There's there's bits and bobs that, that create the frameworks that we want to build on. And then there's the safety security thing, which is next. Um, we're, we're still stumbling, um, not infrequently. Do you hear, you know, and this, you know, DAO or a cryptocurrency or, or NFT scheme or something like that just had, you know, as 60% of its assets wiped out by, you know, finding a bug or somebody, you know, found an exploit or something like that. Right. We're, we're barely able to like get the systems working at bare minimum level. Like you can kind of, you know, wake up in the morning and go check your crypto and go, yeah, it's still there, you know, thank God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, because it's it's not a you know it's not a done deal you know uh, I I have a little bit of crypto and every morning I wake up and thank God it's still there you know? <laughs> it hasn't been wiped out by a bug um, so the the levels above that where we start talking about how do people work together how do you know um, how do we create uh, love and and safety and friend uh, friendship and things like that right that's all you can see from where we are you can see that. Uh, and you can imagine uh, communities swapping um, best practices back and forth. Um, the best practices right now um, are around how not to get yourself killed, basically. Um, so it's kind of like we're in the Wild West phase of- uh, Kind of to uh, become lunch. Yeah. Um, so so rather than Maslow's, may I suggest like the rising of life forms out of the primordial goo, and that we're still kind of in the phase where cell walls burst and the salinity suddenly changes yeah. dramatically and like, oops, we're all dead yeah. uh, and stuff like that. And when we're starting to come into the place where there are simple cellular life forms yeah. um, and they're replicating, so they're able to move around and, and, and kind of do stuff. So we've got a little bit of like kinky sexual reproduction going on uh, in, in the primordial goo, but we don't have complex structures and we don't know how to, you know, yeah, exactly. don't know where it's going. So I, I, and I'd be, very comfortable with the primordial book is the um work. so there is a lot of uh recombination and you know uh innovation and and copying of innovation or or improvement of innovation um but it's really you know cell walls and and things like that it's re and re replication and but that um, conversation seems to be happening like still like in the closet someplace between a few geeks like like i wish that conversation were part of how do we make civilization better? And we're being held in public salons uh, so that like, like that room over there, they're turning our words over here into some code to test and then bring back to us. But we're gonna sit here and talk through what, what are good ways to organize you know, people yeah, to do totally stuff agree. Together. And um, Wendy, Wendy will be giving a talk about DAOs and that's where she's gonna go. You know, um, Hey, look over here, there's stuff going on and it's probably gonna change the world. And I don't know. Maybe you want to be involved. It's it's not hard to get involved. It's yeah. it's super easy to wade in. Um, Rob O'Keefe actually in in one of the OGM channels, non blockchainy. Um, it's not an OGM channel, but mm -hmm. it's a Mattermost channel. He said so. It, it looks like it's me and uh, 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 me and Charles and Pete who are interested in any of this crypto stuff. I, am I weird? You know is. Does, why does nobody care? Am I an outlier? You know, what's, what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's easy to wade in. 
it's confusing and crazy, you know, crazy making and things like that, just like the internet was, you know, back in, you know, 1990, small number. Yeah, but it's funny because the internet's got a bunch of really sophisticated things that run, um, that run the thing, right? That make the tubes run. Um, and yet, um, there we go. Um, the internet's got a bunch of crazy sophisticated things that make everything sort of work, but I could kind of talk you through roughly how, how things like, like happen, like uh, when it gets to routing tables and, uh, and all well, that, like if, I'd probably get if lost. If you teleport yourself back to 1992, right. you know, you, it was, it was the wild west, right? We but, well, but, but but the algorithms were simpler then, and and a lot of the ways that that these devices connected were, um, you know, were working okay. I, they they weren't actually simpler. Really? No, because I because because I find I find very rapidly somebody will say, okay, the, this this works this way, and then let's assume that over here, and then they'll layer five things on top of it, and I was like, but doesn't that violate some of the fundamental assumptions of the underlying layers? And nobody answers that, and like I find very quickly. I'm leveraged into a place for, where uh, really I, I don't, I'm not sure what's happening. Or crypto. Crypto, crypto, crypto. It, it's internet, kind of the no, same thing. In, in 1992, that was the same thing, right? It's like. Um, I wasn't feeling that whatsoever in 92, like, like <laughs> at all. I was like, oh, good, this is a better protocol, and here's how, it's, here's well, how it layers up. Um, I, I think you. So, so then you had more experience or more. You and know, I'm not you, a geek. You were working at it more. Yeah. I, but I'm you not don't, a geek. But I could explain. Need... I could explain to you what and how and why and how how progress was going to happen. Well, so like the difference between UCP mail and and internet mail, right? It's like, okay, I need to mail somebody at university in Stockholm or something like that. Yeah, yeah. and, and like, Fidonet. Um, uh, today, am I going to try to use this new internet mail with the app in the middle or is it a bank path, you know, and where's the bank path and stuff like that, yeah. right? To learn and what a bank path life is, forms. yeah, to learn what a bank path is, is not trivial, you know, it's like, well, it gets a why would arcane, I expect? It gets a little arcane under the hood, but I could say, hey, there's this kind of competition brewing between at signs and bank marks as part of like how we address emails. It's the same exact thing with crypto. It's way, way more opaque to me than that. Like, 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 orders of magnitude more opaque than that. Because, because what's happening feels, feels to me um, uh, complex enough that it's opaque, that it's um, suspicious. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'll say I, it. I, I, I feel like, you know, so the, the internet stuff back in the day, it was, you know, like if you, if you let yourself get involved in it, you knew that the internet stuff was writing on top of TCP IP packets and, you know, you had to know what TCP IP packets were and how many of them stuff to, you know, have, yep. you know, how to split stuff up. There's this still that layer of complexity underneath that you could involve yourself with and go crazy about, right? And at some point you go, I don't know why this internet mail stuff works because, you know, we chopped up stuff and there's duplicated packets and lost packets and, you know, that it's the same kind of stuff over in crypto, you know. You but can, I could explain to you how you can write the above packets that. work. You can write above that and then go, okay, there's proof of stake and proof all of right. work, you know. <laughs> and you don't have to really understand all of the bits and bobs about, you know, hash calculations and stuff like that for proof of work. You can kind of take a top level view of it and go, okay, we want to switch over to proof of stake, you know. And it's the same kind of abstraction of layers and things like that. The, the, the basic... It, I, it, maybe I'm a geek, um, but the basic- I'm not sure the maybe was necessary there, but still. The, the basic uh, you know, operation of DAOs or NFTs or things like that, it's not really more complicated than email or Usenet or you know, whatever. Same, same kind of, you know, and it's got the same kind of depth. All the depth that's under crypto was, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it was you know, routing tables and you know, BGP protocols and all that kind of stuff. Okay, but um, there's a party happening somewhere where these things are being fruitfully improved in community. And not enough non-geeks are participating. I, I think even the, most of, many of the crypto people feel like that too. You know, so Wendy's like, call is for more non-geeks to join that party? Uh, it's a talk at a conference, as far as I understand it. Um, that's, so she came in, you know, now that, now that <laughs> I brought in, primordial stages of evolution or Maslow's hierarchy. Yes. Um, she came in at kind of the top, right? It's like, okay, well, we've had autonomous organizations for, 
for probably you know a couple thousand years right now. We know actually autonomous organizations pretty well, and we know how you would do them to make monopolies or you know um, all the other kinds of weird things that that you, that autonomous organizations do. And it's like well, of course you would kind of make them human scale and have you know care for the community and things like that. So, um, so. My, my assertion to her is that that's not where we are, but meeting in the middle, she and I, it's like, well, but that's where we should go, right, Pete? I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, and a lot of people think that in crypto, you know, a lot of people are going, it's a trillion dollars sloshing around in, you know, crypto stuff, and it's going to matter at some point. And, and to me, to me, current cryptocurrency efforts are mostly like selfish genes. They're basically entirely out for themselves, trying to build something up. And, and, it, and philosophically, this raises the question of, of what if quantum computing, what if, what if qubits could be holistic in some sense and represent whether the world is better or worse off by the transaction at hand? Yeah. And what, um, what, 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 wouldn't, that, just, be, wouldn't that be are, interesting? So a couple levels of the tech stack, but the same use case, people are designing tokens right now that have different social characteristics. Right. Um, so, you know... Uh, people work on that in crypto right now, and and the people who are doing it are specialists rather than you know uh, human factors people. We we need more human factors people, more more people who are going to be affected by crypto in twenty years, um, participating in the the early designing and things like that. But it sounds like we need more guyans or more holistic thinkers or something like that in the mix because because yep. most everybody I see doing this kind of stuff is like. A stoic libertarian objectivist, like looking to maximize local profit. There's, there's a lot of different people. Um, yeah, and and there are a lot of guidance. Um, I I think um, one one of the things that I I can say is true is that there's an immediate like sour taste, like bitter taste. Let's drop that out of our mouth and not try to keep chewing. Um, because of Silk Road, because of people who tried to make billions of dollars, because of you know no, lots of theft God. and stuff like that. Um, as as I've said in, in another call with you and a bunch of other people, um, there's a pony in there. Um, it's not all hype. Um, yes, there is a trillion dollars sloshing around doing crazy stuff, and a trillion dollars makes people crazy. Yes. But the tech, the underlying technology is useful, and it's currently being used in in valuable and interesting ways. Um, and it's going to continue to grow and take over more of our lives. You know, more, more people should get into it, even though there's that bitter taste of, oh my God, it's, it's, it's the wild west. If I go out, you know, uh, in the middle of daylight in, in this dusty old town, I'm going to get shot. So, so, so to me, in the march of human progress and civilization, the monetization of everything uh, and the commodification of everything was were not really good steps. Like the, the, these did not improve civilization, even though they made it more efficient and yeah, more whatever. Yeah. And and what this feels like is like, oh great, now we're moving into an era where you will know the location and meta identity and everything behind every object, and you'll have to acquire every object, uh, everything that's virtual the, that's or otherwise. The bitter taste, right? Well, it's not just bitter taste. It could be the poison pill. It, it, it could it, be that, that we're turning uh, the whole world into fubu. Yeah, no. It's um, uh, a different way to look at it at the same technology is like, oh my God, now we can have multi-valued tokens. You know? Now we can actually value you know, people, planet, um, and profit you know, yeah. at the same time. Um, so the, the technology that we're talking about is is a potential savior. It's a potential path out of the mess that we've gotten with mono-valued mono uh, money. So is Vitalik Buterin one of the people who's talking about Gaia and multi-valued currencies and this lovely path out? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't follow Vitalik very, I'm, very much. I'm, I'm just saying there's like a couple of really loud I voices that all I, sound to me like the same voice, uh, which is the opposite it's, of that. It's the That's the bitter thing, right? It's like, you know, uh, I, no offense to, to Mr. Buterin and, um, but, but from afar, what I see him doing is scrambling like, like the Dickens to make sure his, his, uh, the, the little, um, uh, 
timber house that he's built on the prairie doesn't fall over. Um, um, and it's in danger of falling over all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I think he's totally absorbed in just making sure that you know Ethereum can do lots of transactions and and it's going to you know swap over to Ethereum too and and be proof of stake rather than proof of work. I think he's completely focused on that and doesn't have any any mind space for anything else. Yep. There, um, I you know there there are people doing the good work you know who are saying um, let's you know okay now we've got cryptocurrency let's make uh, let's fix currency. Um, Mark or Stacy, any thoughts on this? Well, I don't I don't have the right language, but if you remember, Jerry, I had sent you those seeds, mm -hmm. and it, I couldn't get it to go through. <clears throat> but I know that um, I know that you're friends with Yoakum, and I think he could explain more about what's going on there. But I think there are some really good people because I was there like when they were first starting up a couple of years ago, and I watched the human part of it. And even though I didn't understand the rest of it, I know that I like what's there. And I know that um, some other people that I follow, like Anna Lou Smithson, is very involved there. And that's mm -hmm. a signal to me right there. So I would recommend you look and check what's going on there. Thank you. And this is Joachim Stroh, right? I'm pretty sure he, he's aware, you know, he, I don't know how, I don't know how involved he is now, but I know a while back he had his finger in there. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, the the originator, his name is, is Reiki Gordon. Reiki Gordon, I believe yeah. Our, I've got, uh, I'm going to sh screen share so we can uh, see who, what, where. So here's Seeds, a regenerative financial system, Reiki Corden, a currency with a conscience, comes out of Haifa DHO, distributed human organization. I've already got them under potential OGM architecture components uh, and under regenerative agriculture and a couple of videos. I haven't watched all these videos, so I don't exactly know or remember all of the moving parts, but that's, uh, I'll connect this to today's call. Well, there are a lot of videos where they filmed how they created the constitution. Uh-huh. So. Oh, that's Okay, good, I'm glad they're on your. Yeah, thank you. In your brain. <laughs> they're in the map. In the map. They have the seal of approval, that's the best you'd say. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I'm I'm trying to figure out where these conversations are having and who's having the conscious conversation. And my fear is that there's only a few people in dark corners having the fruitful conversations, and they will be swamped and just forgotten in history, as happens. Like like at these stages, people who are trying to say things that are good for the whole don't often survive the the winnowing process of what becomes the set of guidelines for the next tranche of progress. And I think. Pete made a good point when he was talking about like not having the language for something. It's also like you, you just get caught up, like you don't even realize, like I catch myself thinking in the old ways when I think that, oh, that's not me. I'm thinking a whole different thing, but it's just, we're programmed. We're so used to a certain way of thinking that we really need to take a step back and get a fresh pair of eyes. Agreed. Uh, Mark, any thoughts? Um, I completely agreed, um, Stacy. Um, certainly, um, my experience with getting sick um, was a heck of a lot of got to get back to work, 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 got to get back on the treadmill. Why? When? When can I do that? <laughs> it's like, the um, that's a that's a tough nut to crack. Um, and what? Um, I made a comment the other day, and uh, uh, I appreciated um, Laura Ann. Uh, oh, forget the last name. Um, Edwards. Edwards. Uh, comment. Um, but basically, I've, I've you know encountered communities, and you know they have different tones and different feels, and. Um, you know, there are people who have large organizations who are doing 
really interesting things that I just react to like, ooh, um, I, I don't fit here. Um, and shall I continue with that organization because of means and ends? Or should I aesthetically say, you know, I want a place I belong. And that's a, that's a tough question in the Wild West. Um, uh, you know, um, Pete, Jerry, and Stacy feel safe. Hooray. <laughs> and they don't try to sell me. Um, they don't try to manipulate me. Um, they don't try to, and, and, you know, this, the sales and marketing and branding kind of way that the internet has evolved into um, feels creepy. And, and I, I'm not, um, you know, I haven't put the time into investigating DAOs. I just kind of said, aha, here's a chunk of uh, decentralized organization and you know, when somebody works it out, I'll put a toe in and, and, and see if I can take a look at it. Um, but I've kind of ignored it and ig ignored it with a purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, basically read more stuff um, and, and think about uh, some of the stuff that um, is more semiotic and basically how do we create meaning and make sense together rather than how do we coordinate our actions in a way that we're not stepping on each other's toes. We have a sense of fairness and that fairness is trusted and there's somehow some currency or money or, or, or value that is different from the kind of value that um, is meaning in life um but it's actually um putting food on the table um and putting food on the table is incredibly important it's just not something i'm i'm great at <laughs> hey i can empathize and i always refer to it as putting food on your family just in honor of w and his malapropisms um thanks mark yeah and and, and from my own take relative to what you were just saying, I can see an easy path to creating or a DAO or sort of instantiating a DAO for OGM and working our way through some of these things together as an experiment, but partly because I think we have a community that's pretty high trust. Uh, we haven't been forged through fire very much. So, you know, that, that tends to make communities different. Um, but I think we have a, a, you know, there's a lot of possibility and potential here, which is kind of why I'm trying to figure out where is the, where is the fruitful civilization level conversation happening to share DAO building instructions back to what Pete started with, because the initial conditions of this drive everything. And, and in this case, it's code and a series of smart contracts and, and, and you know, and, and ways of, of determining play. And most DAOs do not appear to be Calvin ball at this point where these things are easily changed anywhere you feel like it later down the road. I think it, it feels like most of them, you're kind of pouring concrete foundations pretty early with rebar that are going to be hard to move around. Um, April and I were just reminiscing about being in Vienna for a trip two years ago um, and seeing the flak towers. Have you, do you all know about the flak towers that were in Berlin and Vienna and a bunch of uh, European cities? Um, and these things are monster facilities, like monstrous facilities, poured of concrete and rebar and whatnot. And they would put uh, any aircraft weapons up on top. And you might, you might be lucky and drop a bomb on it and wipe out the people on it one time, but the tower wasn't going to crumble. So, you know, and these things are still standing and unlikely ever to be taken down. And it feels to me sometimes like some of the, the tech artifacts that we're building are, are like that. They're hard to, hard to unwind, although much less difficult to unwind than poured concrete in the middle of a city. Uh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I have a heck of a lot of disagreements with Jaron Lanier. Yeah, me too. 
<laughs> however, <laughs> however, <laughs> however, dude is smart. Um, yeah. Dude, yeah. Dude, dude has a uh, dude also <laughs> smart. Yeah. And uh, you know, <laughs> in one of his earlier books, he talks about you know the kind of lock-in that we have with uh, um, word processors. Um, you know, boy, WordStar, boy, that was like everything. And then it became WordPerfect and then Microsoft Word. And now it's like Google, uh, Google Docs. And um, uh, that's not exactly a flak tower, but, but still somehow um, there's Microsoft a lot. Microsoft Word is. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Microsoft Word is totally a flak tower. <laughs> Okay. Microsoft Office kind it, of. It has, uh, you get you get um, a theoretician talking about WYSIWYG and Microsoft mm -hmm. Word, and it's like, okay, that's where we went wrong. I, and they know the name of the guy who invented Microsoft Word, and it's like, wow. I, I think I've had this discussion with uh, not Bob Frankston, but um, who else the has it been? Um, the spreadsheet guy. Yeah. Uh, Bricklin. Bricklin. Um, the, the Dan Bricklin didn't invent the spreadsheet to do calculations. It was actually a layout machine. Um, but then he's like, okay, so then we got Microsoft Word. Everybody thinks they're a layout, <laughs> layout person. And it's all terrible. And it's none of it is semantic. And <laughs> so here's Charlie Strauss writing an essay why Microsoft Word must die. I don't know if that's what you were thinking about, but. Uh... Uh, I, well, if I were you, I would yeah. link it to Slack Tower. To where? <laughs> Slack Towers. Well, I already, no, I, look, I already did that. Thank God. Mm -hmm. Okay. My oh, life so is you, complete. So, so wait, you're saying, you're saying I would link Microsoft Word to Slack Towers? Yes. Yes. That's only a metaphor that's going to work in this conversation. <laughs> Although here. It's just, just a powerful metaphor. Just I, to make, I, I love it. Hold on. Hold on. Let me just do this. So now, now I can create a, so this has happened in our conversation. So it gives context from our conversation. Yep. I'm wait, waiting for the damn beach ball to go away. And now I can connect this up to Flag Towers. And, and Microsoft Word. And Microsoft Word, and that didn't work. Come on, baby. There we go. Okay, and I'll stop screen sharing for a second. Um, so, yeah, and, and my fear is that new paradigms when they get popular and kind of eat the world, eat the world for a long time. Like, like we end up in, in those things for 10 years to hundred years. Yep. Um, and, and, and so I'm, and we're in one of these uh, punctuated equilibrium moments, right this, right this minute. Like we're, we're living and breathing through one of the moments of chaos between regimes. Um, and a lot, and this is why I have the, the, what are the two new stacks question in my head which is a whole bunch of different assumptions about how society works, how we vote, how we cooperate, how we fund uh, benefits for humans, how we assemble companies into things, how value gets measured, how value gets moved around and rewarded. All them things are up for renegotiation right now. And there's some really clever solutions out there. There's a bunch of ponies that have like, like pasted on bat ears and uh, you know elephants trunks and stuff like that. And we're like, no, 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 no. Where, where's like the actual pony? Where's the sparkle pony? Um, and how do we like make sure that, that the future regime is mostly sparkle pony, right? But my fear right now is that the regime is gonna be platypus and uh, you know, platypus have nasty barbs on their legs you don't want to get close to. Um, Jerry, there's an underlying assumption in that um, transition between order, um, having chaos in the middle. Um, I'm, I have a suspicion. It's, it's certainly not a grounded. Um, we love that kind of thing. Go for it. Um, notion that as we have accelerated the way that humans are able to connect with each other, there's no order that we're actually headed towards. It's all... It's chaos all the way down um, in the future. You know, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, but it seems as if, you know, the J curve, the hockey stick, um, 
phenomena that there are so many interacting parts um, to culture, um, to economics, to um, technology and the speed that I'm, I'm not sure that there is a emergent order that I can point to. Maybe that's because we're in the chaos. I, mm -hmm. I, I can certainly, um, you know, agree that, you know, that's where we have, where we are in the process of emergence, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure that there is an order on the other side um, in the way that civilization used to work um, or used to be thought of certainly in the enlightenment um, and in any post enlightenment regime that I, that I really know of. So I, I don't know, Pete, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but I think, I think clearly one of the possible outcomes of the next 50 years is a really extremely chaotic, everyone to themselves kind of, kind of world where governments have kind of lost authority and broken apart. Uh, people have split away in different ways and found and managed to protect different strongholds or something like that. And that there's generalized kind of chaos across the land. And what, what a thousand years from now, if there's still any humans around, might be seen as the second dark ages, just like we wound up with the second world war. Um, so I, I don't think that's out of the question. And uh, a lot of the stuff ha that's happening right now is of a life-changing extinction level event importance that, that the, the, the forces are on the ground that could lead us in that kind of direction. I think just because humans being humans and looking back on history, um, and I was just looking at, uh, uh, and, and I was kind of curating this part of my brain recently. So I've got the revolutions of 1848, the springtime of the peoples, the Prague uprising, the German revolution, the French revolution of 18. Yeah, by, by the way, there's been a whole bunch of French revolutions. I didn't realize that. And a whole bunch of Paris communes. Um, uh, but then but then this thought that came out of a book or an article that I read, probably the largest and most violent systemic crisis occurred between 1854 and 1871. It's the Meiji Restoration. It's the Indian Rebellion. It's the Sepoy Mutiny. It's the Gundot site in Germany, uh, the Spanish Glorious Revolution, and then preceded by the revolutions I just pointed to. And, and this basically changes, you know, these are sort of, and I was trying to create um, a thought called Years of Turmoil, and I was putting, um, you know, our current protests. I, I think I created this little, this tiny nexus here back in 2019 when we had um, street protests and a whole bunch of stuff. And this is connected to was 20, 2006 peak democracy and, and, and so on. So, so I think we're in the mill right now. We're in, we're in the, the, the great reshaping. And one of the reasons I love um, our work in OGM is that I feel like we're fighting the good fight to try to figure out what the next ground rules are and how to live together and, and how to explain those damn things to, to uh, other people who aren't involved yet. And maybe even uh, recruit them into being part of a, of a civilization that's busy trying to share knowledge and rebuild how to, how to do stuff right. Right, that, that's, what, that's what's energizing about this whole effort for me. Um, and I don't know if you wanna riff on that Pete, but where you fall on, on those spectra. I, it's, I, I find it really hard to, I, I can imagine a bunch of different paths, um, but it's hard to imagine which one is gonna be the one. It's a, but, but can you see fruitful paths? Oh yeah, definitely. The, um, I think I mailed it to the OGM list. There was, there was that cool article about, uh, Went to the other list, a, a guided civic revival, hmm. and I, I actually, when I look at that, it's um, <laughs> it it looks like a bit of a Trojan horse to me, um, the way that the article is written, mm -hmm. um, because uh, because they have this huge bibliography, um, and bibliography is it's a lot of it is about economics so it it looks to me like a trojan horse that you would wheel into the economic halls and say oh look you know you can just tell that we should you know have a well a well cited econ paper uh we should have a guided civic retrieve by uh, revival right um and then the economists and you know their ivory towers can go hmm guided civic revival that sounds like great you know in the meantime i think there are other people going you know revolt <laughs> revolution 
and they're talking about the same thing, um, just in different language. Remember Small is Beautiful? Yep. And I, you know, I am highly influenced by the whole Earth Review and the and the Coevolution Quarterly. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly, you know, love place. I mean, for my birthday, I went to West Marin, and it's mm. like ah, I feel good here, <laughs> and I feel rooted to this wonderful place um, because I go there again and again and again, and I pay attention to landscape and climate and you know um i went to dillon beach and you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you because of the fog and it was just ah this is weird i wouldn't have chosen to go here if i knew that there was fog here but right. it's um what i choose to be with in a particular kind of way and the i i was fortunate to uh, connect with uh, uh laura edwards and she's she thinks in a different way than i do but i can learn from it mm -hmm. i i find that she sparks um at least seven different flips of my way of thinking and one of them you know i think about meaning in a linguistic way and laura thinks about meaning in a value way and i didn't get that until she 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 brought that up and um yeah anyway i'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it but the what value we can create together i mean you 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 went through this you know how is value created who's creating the value um before jerry um i want to listen to the uh, recording of this and and uh, get all of them exactly but um i keep on going back to my own experiments of having campfires i get two other people who don't know each other the conversation is incredible um and then here we are at four and, and, you know, other calls, we have 20. And that's of a kind of scale, a kind of network dynamics. And we're talking here about network dynamics from, you know, maybe individual to the entire Gaia. And these network dynamics of say DAOs, which I'm open completely to understanding and, and paying more attention to. Um, uh, certainly, uh, um, I told uh, Brewster um, that, you know, when it comes to cryptocurrency, I'm kind of a, uh, a Luddite. Um, and he goes, a Luddite working at the Internet Archive? Are you sure? <laughs> like well segmentation here but um the dao seems to be able to or at least thought about you know this what it, what is the scale of the dao is, is the simple question um is it 20 people is it 500 people is it above or below the dunbar number is it um you know the scale of uh, apple or ibm or or not um, you know, does this make sense at the level of the ability to get the type of things done that we want in our culture, like MacBooks, like Microsoft Word, <laughs> like, you know, things that are big, things that, that take time and, and a heck of a lot of coordination and are valuable, um, you know, um, space colonies that type of thing um yeah. hmm don't know um interesting uh conversation uh thank you for bringing this up and for uh stirring the thoughts around yeah thanks mark um there's an interesting human tension between the desire to be a little extended family tribe 
um, which is what humans are supposed to be. And this massive billions of people machine that humanity has become. And it's just, you know, it's, it's a part of life. There's a real dichotomy there. They're two different things, um, except we, we have a foot in both of them. And I knew nothing. I mean, I didn't remember adding this book <clears throat> to my brain before, but um, this is from 1941 by Leopold Kor, who's a really famous thinker in this area. But disunion now, a plea for society based upon small autonomous unions is like what we're talking about, right? Yeah. As far as I can tell. Yep. Um, and core is kind of the spark of small is beautiful, which is the thing that heads toward, uh, you know, uh, E.F. Schumacher and Hazel Henderson, who studied under Schumacher, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's like a whole lineage there. Um, but I'd be really interested in sort of seeing if, if anybody's updating those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, tables of six are a really great conversational size. Like that's a, that's a very, very nice size for having several different interesting conversations and not being overwhelmed and you know, getting to know everybody who's at the table and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, Russ Acoff, uh, when he would set up workshops and do stuff, he would use you know, Miller's magic number seven plus or minus two uh, to do the groups. So each table would have seven plus or minus two people at it, no more than nine, because that's the number of people you, whose, whose threads you could hold in your head. You could, you kind of track that that number of people. Yeah, it looks like uh, Paul Pangaro um, archived the, the essay. Is it a book, an essay? Do you know what length it is? Essay. Okay, cool. That's great. That means it's just a long read. <laughs> There's just too many interesting long reads. And I, you know, um, I need to move myself faster into the place where we're munching on long reads together. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And mulching them and composting them together and figuring out how, what the connections are and talking about these kinds of lineages and threads, these, these little mycelial connections between ideas together. Um, speaking of this, yes. um, uh, Mary Midgley, I mentioned in a, a past conversation, and I, I went back to her um, book, um, Wisdom, information, and wonder. What is knowledge for? I mean, certainly, you know, I'm coming in on the, um, you know, global brain kind of idea. Well, there we go. This is, this is what I did not explicitly ask for, but what I wanted to see. Thank you. <laughs> mm, cool. And I've not read this book. I don't remember even that it's in my brain. So thank you for totally highly suggested um, first chapter. Huh. Um, you know. Uh, why are we doing these knowledge practices, um, uh, especially when it comes to specialization? Yep. Um, and uh, a very, very wise set of questions that she's asking in the first chapter um, and, and goes on to, to you know, engage them more deeply. Um, but, you know, the, the point of information can't be just to store it. And I brought that up at a, uh, at a meeting, uh, you know, one of the open lunches at the uh, uh, Internet Archive before I joined them. Um, used to go to the Friday lunches all the time. And the reply was, yeah, but we have to store it too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's a very difficult technical um, task that takes a heck of a lot of resources. Um, and yes, I agree. Yes, we have to store it too, but it can't be only storage. Mm -hmm. um, a long read, um, very valuable. Thank you. Looks really interesting. Um, I, and these days, one of the first things I do is find out if there's a really good review of it or if somebody did a video explaining it on YouTube. Um, because usually, usually, often I'll find a 20 minute digest of a good book that, that brings me up to date kind of. And then now and then it's like, oh shit, I gotta read this. Which is why I'm reading Ai Weiwei's biography now, which is fascinating, just fascinating. His father's birth was a bad portent for his family. So they sent him off to live with like poor folk. Here's one line from my 1,000 plus notions from the book, uh, a line that I read yesterday or the day before yesterday. 
Systems of external reward are notoriously as crude and uncertain in their working as systems of punishment. Mm -hmm. and, this is the extrinsic rewards trump in, intrinsic motivation kind yeah, of thing. That, Where, where's the quote from? Um, somewhere in the book, okay. um, probably the third chapter. From Midgley's wisdom book? Yeah. Thank you. But, you know. Um, and all of this goes right back to hell the Dows and the design of Dows. Exactly. I mean, it's right there. Yes. Um, you know, what is the value of knowledge itself for its own sake? And, you know, what is the value of knowledge as a commodity? Mm -hmm. um, you know. Well, Ooh, Pete, thank you. Anyway, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we've, we've gone an hour and Pete did draft some more paragraphs to a note that I should send looking for a virtual assistant. We should look at it real quick. We should look at it real quick. Let's um, go back to it over here. <laughs> so, uh, hi, it's Jerry. I've got a new podcast. Let me get the thumbnails out of the way. Um, I've got a new podcast coming up called Leaving the World, which is about blah, blah, blah. I'm looking for a smart and thoughtful person to help with doing the operations side of Leaving the World. Things like looking for hosting services for the podcast, helping me schedule and book guests, keeping track of all the little tasks that we need to get done. Someone you might know, please ping me with leads or questions, thanks. Um, so is this a description of, uh, is this the best description of what, what I'm looking for? I think is the, the question. Mark, go ahead. Uh, time limit. Uh, basically, uh, there's- Hours per, hours per month or week or something? Yeah, there's, there's no notion of uh, amount. A budget or a time? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not looking to hire a full-time person, that's for sure, so yeah. Uh, is it monthly or? Um, I don't actually know sort of a rhythm of, of, uh, of how many episodes that might, might turn out because, because a piece of me is playing with how much of the normal conversations we're having, even like this one, actually are, are pieces of this conversation weaving the world episodes in some sense, right? Uh, because there, there, there are things that we were talking about that make a lot of sense in that context here. Uh, from how do DAOs fit to Leopold Kaur and Mary Midgley? And good old EF. And EF Schumacher was at the coal board. It's, it's astonishing to me in world history how many things find their way back to coal. Coal is like this, this, this ugly, dusty thing at the heart of so much of human history. Coal, unlike oil, right? Unlike oil, yeah, sort of. Um, you know, the sappers in World War I are basically coal miners from wherever the surviving coal mines were in England because they knew how to dig and, and stay alive. The, and in the Civil War as well. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, we get a lot of human activity around energy. Yeah. And food. Um, and killing other humans, and taking yeah. their possessions. Exactly. Time honored tradition. At, at least for our culture. Yeah. 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 Exactly. There, and there were other cultures where it wasn't such a big deal, but it's and the, the, the problem is the interface between those two those two types of cultures. That that's really problematic in human history. Yep. I mean, one of one of my big questions is how do you create a pacifist culture that can survive assault by not so pacifist cultures? Yep. That's, that's really important. Yep. How do you, and, and walk away was in, interesting in that way, like Cory Doctorow's book, because he's like, just walk away from the thing you built because you can always build a new one. And in fact, the new one you can improve because you've changed your mind about the, the, the software designs for how to do stuff. And then you just instantiate it because we've invented matter compilers and you can, get, you know, uh, you can get water from moisture in the air, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not quite that far on the tech. 
And I don't know what other visions are, are appealing in, the, in this sense, because uh, human history is just this bad story of, of interesting civilizations wiped out by their warring neighbors. Go ahead, Mark. You've heard of uh, what people have called uh, the books of Ian M. Banks? The culture series? Yeah. I think it's something like automated luxury communism, but there's also gay automated luxury communism. Right. And, and, you know, it's. Uh, there's Falk, which is, uh, uh, yeah, what's the F4? Free? No. Um, fully automated luxury. Fully That's automated. Fully automated luxury communism. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't heard of that acronym, but thank you. Yep, yep, Falk. Uh, there we go. And I hadn't heard of, of the different variants. So I've got uh, Falk here, but not the others. And utopian visions of automation. Uh, automation may bring us a comfy future. Uh, here's one, AI could perfect communism. You know, the, uh, the work of... Um cyberneticist Stafford Beer. Oh, yes. Um, uh, was moving in that AI could perfect communism uh, notion. But uh, Stafford yeah. is a really cool thinker. And, and his books are a mixture of typeset and hand drawn. Mm -hmm. And they're very, they're, they're not abstract and flaky. They're just, they're like integral and beautiful. And I wish, I wish I'd actually spent more time finishing and reading. I, which one was it? Platform for Change is the one the I had. Th this one was, this is the one that I had, yeah. Yeah, and the pages are different colors. Uh-huh. Like, it's not all white and white and black. But... He must have been held for his publishers to work with, but really fun uh, as a thinker. Teams Integrity. And he got wrapped up into Project CyberSyn with Allende in Chile, which ended badly. which ended really badly. Um, anyway, thank you for um, this conversation. Let me go back to the letter for a second. Um, so, I, I, so Pete, thank you for, for what you wrote. I think I need to just spend a little bit of time with the second paragraph, uh, looking for you know what the tasks I, are. But, you could totally rewrite it. Um, um, well, I, I like the rest of it. Yeah. Fully automated luxury gay space communism. Darn it. And know your meaning. Sweet. That's Sweet. the whole cool thing. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot about space. Good old space. Yeah. It's like nuke the gay whales for Jesus, which was a thing back in the 80s, I guess. And nuke the gay whales for Christ. Yeah. Um, thank you. More soon? No, I'm, I'm just I'm 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 uh, I'm censoring myself because Richard Cadry had a set of bumper stickers that were guaranteed to get you pulled out of your car and beaten to a pulp in the south. But um, it's not Sounds appropriate. Pretty good. It's not a, it's not appropriate for this conversation uh, because it's being recorded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> To be, to be, uh, um, yeah. So, so, Jerry, it's time to stop the recording. Then. I, I think that's entirely I can correct. say one or two things and then we can. can there we go.